Welcome to the November 25, 2008 edition of the Open Forum. Once again, we have the privilege and the pleasure of looking together into the Word of God, the Bible. Oh, my, my. It's such a pleasure to read the Bible and learn from the Bible. Now, sometimes it's very frustrating because we read verse after verse and we don't know quite what to do with it. But at least this is a program where you can uh, call up and we can look at that difficult verse and maybe we can find an answer from the rest of the Bible as to what that verse really is talking about. But this is your program. We want to hear from you. So shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping. I can't <clears throat> begin to tell you how much your uh, your ministry has meant to me. I've learned so much from you. Uh, I can't even begin to tell you. Um, from the radio station to your Bible teachings, all of it really has meant so much to me. Um, I'd like to point to uh, Luke 4. Luke uh, verses 17, 18, and 19. Let's look at that. Luke 4, verses 17, 18, and 19. And there was delivered unto him, this is Jesus, he's in the synagogue in Nazareth where he, uh, where he was raised. He came there as a little boy, maybe four or five years of age from Egypt, and uh, there he uh, was uh, worked for his father, his stepfather Joseph, as a, as a carpenter or brick mason or some kind. And uh, now he's come back uh, because he has been uh, officially, be, he has officially begun his work as to demonstrate how he suffered as Savior. And he comes to Nazareth, to the synagogue, and there he uh, preaches a sermon. He came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found a place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, what is your question? Anthony, I have a follow-up verse that I'd like to point you to, please. I'm sorry? I have a follow-up verse that I'd like to point you to, and that would be the verse in Isaiah. Oh, Isaiah? Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. The whole thing. All right, let's look at that. And you're looking at which verse? Uh, the whole thing, sir. I'm sorry? The whole thing, sir. The whole chapter? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, well, we <laughs> we wouldn't have time. It's, it, I, I, it's, sir, it's very important. Uh, there's, uh, there's a, I'm sorry? It's very important. Well, uh, it, the, the chapter is dealing with the fact where we see Isaiah having a vision and seeing God on the throne... And above him, the the uh, 
uh, the seraphim, which is a representation of God as the judge. And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then uh, this really made a, an enormous impact on Isaiah. In verse 5, he, Isaiah says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, you see, he's seeing Christ, or he's seeing God as the judge of all the earth because the seraphim represent God as the judge. And whenever we read the Bible, we are being judged by the Bible. It's like we're looking at God as the judge, and it should make us feel, uh, uh, recognize, man, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Oh, God, have mercy, have mercy on me. And this, uh, here is Isaiah's reaction. He's saying, Woe is me, I am undone, I am a man of unclean lips. I, that is, I am a sinner. And then flew one of the seraphim unto me. Now, this is a very, very important statement. There flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Now think of this. He's looking at God as the judge, represented by the seraphim that were above the throne. And it is a seraphim, a seraph, that is gone to the altar and taken a burning coal and touch the lips of Isaiah so that and indicated thine iniquity, all your sins have been taken away. Thy sin is purged. You are cleansed. Now think of this. This is Christ as who is the judge of all the earth. He is also the Savior. This is the huge lesson that is being taught here. He is also who, uh, the Savior. Then this, in turn, brought about another reaction in Isaiah. We read, He laid it on my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? That is, who is going to be a representative of the kingdom of God here on this sin-stricken earth? And I replied, uh, uh, Here am I, send me. And there is the gospel uh, declaration that every true believer is called upon to use his life to the highest possible degree to share the gospel. And an integral part of the gospel today is to, to warn people that Judgment Day is just around the corner, May 21, 2011. Then it goes on, and we read something very curious. It says, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man and the land to be utterly desolate. Now, this is picked up in uh, Mark chapter 4, this, uh, this uh, passage in 
in Isaiah. It's picked up in Mark 4, where God is, Christ is explaining to the, uh, to the disciples why he spoke in parables. He said, uh, 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 when, uh, he had just given them a parable earlier on in Mark 4. And then in verse 10, he, when he was alone, and they that were about him with the twelve asked of him of the parable. And, unto you, and he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all things are done in parables that seeing they may see and may and not perceive and hearing they may hear and not understand lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them and and then he explains uh, that uh, verse 33 in Mark 4 with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it but without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. You see, God hid the major truths of the Bible from those who were the non-elect of the world, uh, and that's the majority uh, part of the world, uh, uh, because he made no arrangement to save them at all. And so he wrote in parables so that these individuals, they read the Bible but can never come to a real understanding. And it's only if we're a true believer that we finally get to a greater and greater understanding. We finally understand what it means to be saved and so on. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, I've got a couple of questions, and my first question follows up on the answer that you, you just gave this first caller, and it's regarding sharing the gospel with an unbeliever. I understand that the Bible teaches that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, but does the, does the Holy Spirit need us to explain the timeline or Christ's return, or the nature of judgment, or salvation, in addition to sharing the actual words of God? In other words, is, is sharing Bible verses not enough? Well, How then should a believer share the gospel with the unsaved, is what I'm asking. Well, uh, the fact is that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, but we uh, carry the armor of God. Remember, in Ephesians 6, the, we have the sword of the Spirit, and, the, and uh, we have uh, the shield of faith and so on, which enables us to be faithful in sharing that gospel. Now, the, uh, we, we don't know who are the elect of God. Only God knows that. We share the gospel with anyone and everyone that will listen. That will listen. It doesn't mean that because they're listening attentively that they will become saved. We don't have any idea about that. We're not sharing it with them so that they can become Bible scholars because you can become a Bible scholar and still not be saved. Our salvation is not dependent on how many facts we know from the Bible, but we share the gospel with them so that they are placed in an environment. They're encouraged to read the Bible. They're in an environment where if God does plan to save them, uh, he... Uh, he can save them. Remember the verse in Romans chapter 10, faith cometh by hearing. That is, Christ, who is the very essence of faith, cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we want to do our witnessing in the context of presenting what we can present from the Bible. 
And then we have to leave it to God altogether to do the saving if that is his plan to save that person. More than just the actual verses, is it the verses, if I share a verse with somebody, do I also need to explain that to them? Do I also need to teach them, you know, share with them what the Bible is actually saying? Is it, is, does the Holy Spirit need us to share more than well, a verse? Well, the, the Bible is given to us to share, and of course, we're going to share it in an incomplete way because uh, we all are learning from the Bible We try our best to be as faithful as we can, but above all, we want to encourage that person to get into the Word of God. And and this is God's plan to send out the gospel. Now, think of it. God is God. He could have reached his elect people, who we now know numbers probably 200 million people, uh, he could have reached them uh, through some other means, uh, 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 without a- the uh, without any any activity on our part. As a matter of fact, in our day, uh, God is is uh, uh, the big action is to get people into the Word of God, and we are available to try to uh, help them uh, uh, find this or that in the Bible. But actually, the work of saving is 100% the work of Christ. We may never say, never say, I got that person saved, or I have to save that person. That's an absolute uh, discredit to the glory of Christ. Then it's altogether wrong to say that. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good afternoon. Good evening. Yes. Uh, I'd like to thank the Lord Jesus for making this phone call. And my question is, can you show us from the scriptures where the Lord Jesus is going to shoot mercy on, my, on, October 21st, on May 21st to uh, October 21st? show how God shows mercy, there will be no mercy during that 153-day period from May 21, uh, 2011, until October 21, 2011. There will be no mercy, no grace, no, uh, no hope of any kind in the world. It is the day of judgment. It is the day when the gospel is gone completely. All the believers have been caught up to be with Christ in heaven. But you say that uh, God is a merciful God so that he's going to annihilate the unsaved. So that's to mean he's going to shoot mercy on October 21st. But he well, said, well, well, Now, excuse me. Now, we have to be careful. Think of God's mercy that today we're slightly less than two and a half years from that day when Judgment Day begins. What if God came without telling us ahead of time of that date? Uh, What a terrible thing that would be. Nobody would have been thinking ahead at all. I wonder how I stand before God. But God, in his great and wonderful mercy, has given us still two and a half years to to uh, examine the Scriptures very carefully and to know the details of his judgment plan for the end. My, my, talk about mercy. And there's an enormous hope today because the Bible tells us that it's in our day that there are many, many that are being saved. And so don't ever, ever discredit the mercy of God. If finally, however, there comes a day when God has to complete his judgment process. And that is the day of judgment. And 
and and in fact, even there, there is mercy. Think of the traditional view. Think of the traditional view of the judgment of God that has been held in all the churches throughout the church age, that if you are unsaved, if you're not one of God's elect, it is guaranteed you will spend billions of years in a place called hell where you will be suffering enormous torment. It's to go on forever and ever. There's no mercy in that. But the fact is, even though that day of judgment is going to be a horror story uh, beyond anything we can imagine, nevertheless, at the end of 153 days, it will be, everything will be destroyed by fire and will disappear. There will be no, nothing left of any kind. And that is the mercy of God, that that judgment which, which uh, uh, mankind in their cruelty, in their cruelty and lack of understanding of the mercy of God have depicted as a place where he would spend eternity suffering horribly constantly no end to it and that is not going to happen god is a merciful god but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum welcome to open forum why hello i'm calling in from pennsylvania yes I heard today uh, in your third Christmas series on the first chapter of St. Luke, you had mentioned that you do not need to know Christ to be saved. And you had said that John the Baptist didn't know Christ but was saved. Well, Could you well, well, elaborate well, on that? Me. Excuse me. Well, I'm glad you're saying... Well, uh, Will you elaborate on it? Because I didn't say it that way. Or you may have perceived it, that I said it that way, but I would never have said that. When we become saved, it is because we have come into a personal relationship with Christ. Now, John the Baptist was a child of God, but he was going to be meeting Christ literally, physically. And and he did not know him, art thou the Christ, or do we seek someone else? And because he had been given the task of of uh, baptizing him, preparing him for Christ's work as as uh, as uh, uh, as the the chief priest, as the priest who was to off, who was to demonstrate how he offered the sacrifice. And that was his. That was John the Baptist's task. But no, anybody who spiritually John the Baptist would have known Christ. But that isn't. If if let me say it another way. Here you're in Galilee, and here walks up a man. He's a teacher. They, everybody's calling him a rabbi. You are one of God's elect. Do you instantly know that he is the Christ? Of course not. Of course not. Because you don't... Uh, God hasn't given us a picture of Christ so we can know him. But can you know that he is the Christ spiritually uh, when you become saved? The answer, yes. That spiritually, we know Christ. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Um, um, I, I would like to co make some a comment about uh, various things I've had uh, during these three weeks or so. You've been making mention about obey, the word obey. Do you know that the word obey is not well received by today's uh, lifestyle and uh, uh, civilization? No, that I'm, word I'm, obey. I, I, has already, I, has also been taken out of wedding ceremony. You I, know, excuse, when you pre excuse me, I I'm not able to understand you, and you'll either have to 
I don't know, but we may not be able to take this call because if we if I can't understand you, I can't answer your question. So we may have to go to another caller. I'm very sorry, very sorry. Shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, the number to call is one eight hundred five three eight five. All right, so let's take our next caller, please. Hello. Yes. Hello. Okay. My question is, how does Harold Camping know for sure that he is saved? I'll take this over the air. Well, you know, the Bible teaches in Romans eight that God's Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are a child of God. And if we find that we have a real love for the Word of God and have an intense desire to be obedient to the Word of God, to everything that is in the Bible, and we, we really want to know, we, we, we really are recognizing uh, uh, that this is God's, this is right from the mouth of God, and we walk very humbly before God. These are characteristics of a child of God. And as we spend time in the Word, the Holy Spirit will be working with our spirit to encourage us that we are indeed a child of God. Now, unfortunately, most people in the world today who claim that they are a child of God are trusting in something that they have done. They're trusting in their water baptism or their confession of faith or in uh, their faithful attendance of a con of a church, and or in the in the uh, uh, yeah, encouragement from a pastor or an elder or a deacon or other people, uh, they are trusting in those things, and we can't trust in those things at all. The nature of a child of God is that really sets them apart is that they have an intense desire to want to do the will of God. They listen to very carefully and what they can understand, and they're praying for understanding. They want to be obedient altogether. But thank you for sharing that question, and we're, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Well, oh, we have to pause for this message, and then we'll go to our next caller. We're ready for our next caller. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Harold. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Um, I have a question. I, I'm really, I'm really um, frustrated by the changes in, in your teaching, and that I just, I just realized that I just really don't understand very much. So I, let me start with one question. Hopefully, I can have two. Um, Revelation six, verse twelve through fifteen. Revelation 6, verse 12 through 15. Let's look at that. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bond man, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand here we have a description of judgment day this is a, a, a description of what that period of 153 days will be like that it goes from May 21, 2011 to October 21, 2011. It will be a time of great horror. Now, the fact that it says that 
the stars fell and the moon is turned into blood does not mean that that is not talking. We know this after we carefully look at this in the light of other passages of the Bible. does not mean that the physical earth or the physical cosmos, the stars, are, are affected at all. They will be regular days from everything we can know. But this is a the moon turned into blood. The moon spiritually typifies the law of God. And now the law is calling for blood. It is calling for the completion of God's judgment process. And the stars fall uh, indicates that there's no no one left on earth who is a child of God. They've all been caught up to be with Christ. And it will be a time of great pain and horror because these people who are there, and it will be over six billion people from everything we can know from the Bible, were not, were, were not listening. They didn't believe when the message got out that May 21 was the, the day and that when they should have been been pleading with God, oh God, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. No, they they denied it, they were in denial, or they were mocking it, or they were sure that Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And they were right, of course, because they were still in the night, and for them Christ did come as a thief. But for those who were true believers... They were not caught in this. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, uh, Mr. Camping. I have two questions. Yes. Um, the first one uh, involves with uh, most of your other callers. Um, uh, given, and I've been... Um, aware of you for a while now, and given your past with um, proclaiming 1994 to be the end and all that, and then you made an adjustment and added the seven years um, because of the tribulation and, and whatnot, um, I'm just confused because you say as, as the years go on, um, God opens our eyes to see the Bible, um, to see the new, new um, revelations and, and so on in the Bible. Um, it just seems, you know, I'm just skeptical because um, I think if the Lord does that, you know, I don't think you make a mistake with your um, mathematics. Um, I think that that it, um, it would be, um, you'd be more accurate. And um, it just seems you've kind of um, adjusted your play on this. And um, so I just want you to... Well, no, I, well, excuse that, me. That's the first uh, question. Uh, well, that... excuse me, excuse me. Now, back in 1993, no, about now, about 1991, uh, I, I, for already for about 30 years, had been very carefully considering the timeline of history, the unfolding of God's salvation plan, and then I began to see that 1994 was a super important year. Uh, although there were many parts of the Bible I had not yet investigated carefully at all, but I did see that 1994 was a very important year. And as a matter of fact, today it is still a super important year in God's plan for the end. It, it, it was the day when the Holy Spirit was poured out and God began the final ingathering of those that he planned to save. But I didn't see all of that back then. But suddenly uh, I, I thought, wow, this, this, this sounds a lot like it could be the time of the end. And so I felt uh, the world should know about this. So very quickly, very quickly, I wrote the book 1994. Yet I was not sure, I, I, because I knew that I had not looked at a lot of passages in the Bible, 
So on the cover, I put a big question mark. Maybe that it was effectively saying 1994. Maybe in the in the context of the or in the pages of the book, I put sentences like, "Now there may be more. We have to be very careful. There may be more uh, that we have to still discover in the Bible, so it won't be uh, 1994." And as a matter of fact, I even made the suggestion in that book that 2011 might be a possible date. But, and so it came and gone, and uh, it, uh, it was kind of a, a preliminary warning. But then now, 19 years have passed by. Was it 19, since 1994, we have uh, uh, six, well, uh, we have 14 years since 1994 have passed by. And during that time, not only I, but many others have been very intently continuing to study the Bible and to look at more and more Scripture. And, and uh, even then, uh, until about, oh, I would say about six or eight months ago, one could not be really absolutely certain that we had found the date, although things began to point to the dates that now we are uh, saying are going to be the dates, May 21 and October 21 of 2011, uh, and uh, September 7th of 1994 is a very important date, and May 21 of 1988 is a very important date. All those dates uh, began to have greater and greater importance and, and, and tied in with each other with, with apparently great accuracy, but still, still one couldn't say uh, we can be absolutely certain that this is going. These are correct until about five months ago or so, or six months ago, or I, I don't remember the precise time. Uh, looking once more, are there uh, 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 are there any? Is there anything more in the Bible? that tie in these dates. And there was, and God opened our eyes to proof after proof. I, I, I found some of the proofs. Uh, we have a listener who found one, one very important proof. And, uh, and, and when I saw those proofs, I saw that locks these dates in. There's no way that any one of these dates can move one day without upsetting the whole apple cart. And yet, with these dates, exactly the way we have developed them from the uh, study of the Bible, they are locked in by these proofs. And uh, so, that also indicated that the work that had been done in coming to these dates had been done with, ac with great accuracy. And so, that's why... From that point on, I had no option. I couldn't say, yes, there's a high likelihood that that will be the date. I could not say that because that would be a denial of what I'm learning from the Bible. I had no option but to begin to say, this is absolutely certainly going to come to pass. It, it, I hang my whole life on this. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Is, Go ahead with your call. Uh, yes. Um, I'm, I'm calling. I'm sorry. I'm calling to... Um, ask you about the, the um, I, I would like to I would like to um, give a donation to, to um, for the holidays so I'm asking you um, is it Oakland yes. Oakland California yes the address is family radio Oakland yes. Family Family Radio, Oakland, yes. California, nine 
four, six, six two, two one. one. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, the reason I'm calling you also, I would like to know, um, uh, is it, how do you spell Oakland? O A K L A N D. Yes, and, and California, can you shorten it? Yes. C A L I F O R N I A. That's California. Yes. That's California. Nine, four, six, two, one. One. Yes. And well, I thank you so much. Thank, I'll just make... thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Um, okay. We are supporters of Family Radio, so thank you very much. I have a question about your book, We Are Almost There. Yes. Uh, and it says on page 58, in Revelation 9, the Bible speaks of a time when hell will begin on this earth, so on and so forth. And then it goes on to read that those who had been convinced they were saved because they had been teachers and preachers but were not saved and they had not been raptured are still trying to teach their wrong understanding of the Bible. Um, okay, they're typified by locusts and ruled over by Abad and, and Apollyon and are hurting those who are living on the earth at that time. However, they are not to hurt those who have the seal of God on their foreheads. That confuses me because I thought that the saved would be raptured. So right. how is it that that's, the locusts would even be able to hurt anyone with the seal of God on their foreheads? Well, that's why it says they are told that they cannot hurt them because there are none there. You see, uh, you have to remember, God did not write the Bible easy to understand. He wrote it in a very complicated way. And... And when he talks there about locusts and uh, hurting and so on, and they're seeking death and they cannot find it, there's some very difficult language there. And it's, uh, it's because God had to seal this up for 19, almost 2,000 years throughout the church age so that no one would come to an understanding of it. And so now we're coming to an understanding and we're, we're learning that the language God used was very difficult. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I have one other question. Yes. And it's from the same book. And on page 62, God's judgment process continues while a great multitude are saved. Then uh, it goes on to read... Uh, during the last 6,100 days of the 8,400-day Great Tribulation period, the true believers who will be outside the churches are being used of God to bring into the kingdom of God a great multitude which no man could number. And I've heard you put a number on that, so that's confusing to me. Oh, well, we uh, oh, that's, that's an interesting observation. I hadn't quite thought about that. Because, I'm, But you have to remember that the 200 million that we read about uh, later on in, uh, or also in, uh, in, in uh, beginning on page or on, in Revelation 9, that includes all of the true believers from, uh, from uh, Abel, all the way till the end, although by all, uh, by all odds, the vast multitude of them, majority of them, are being saved today. But but it is a to total number because remember, those who were true believers like Moses or well, no, Moses is not a good illustration because uh, he later on God took his body to heaven. But uh, but like David or Peter or uh, anyone else that we know that was saved, their bodies are still in the in the earth, 
and their bodies are going to be raptured uh, on that last day, just as the bodies of people who just died yesterday, mm -hmm. as well as the body, uh, those who are living, will be instantly changed. And so, uh, virtually the whole, uh, virtually every single person who ever became saved will be raptured on that last day. But insofar as the, the number who are being saved, then uh, during that final period, we don't know. It could be, it could be uh, 180 million of the 200 million. We don't know. I see. And secondly, we can't know because they are, uh, there's nobody keeping count. In the church age, people kept count. We know approximately very closely how many people identify with a local congregation today because churches keep cradle rolls and uh, uh, baptismal rolls and uh, memberships uh, and so on. And so if you add them all together, you can know pretty accurately how many people are identified with the church. But when God is saving completely outside of any organization like that, there's no way we can know. I see. So that's really quite literal, which no man could number because it's he's impossible. not going to reveal that number. It's impossible, yes. You know. Okay. Well, thank you, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hello? Yes. Go ahead with your call. Uh, I have a question. I am a new believer. Uh, I listen to your program uh, day, day to day, and then I still not quite understand about you, you many, many times say uh, we're almost there, and then and you said, and then the year of 2011, uh, May 21st, is that going to be uh, people, all people got uh, Paris or? Well, the, that is why with Family Radio, we have prepared this little book. It's only got 70 pages in it. We're almost there. So that, and all the information in that book came from the Bible. It comes out of the Bible. So that you can look at the Bible at the places that we take note of and make your own decision. Have we understood the Bible correct or not? It is not written to tell anybody, now listen, this is the truth. Yeah, you, uh, because we say so. No way. We don't want anybody to trust me, you know, or anybody in family radio. They have to. You trust only the Bible. And then, if you trust the Bible, you'll hang your whole life on that, and it'll make a profound difference in how you're going to be living these next two and a half years. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, yeah, um... I've been uh, listening to your show since uh, around 1989, and uh, I, lo I love your ministry. I support family radio, and I haven't always agreed with everything you taught, uh, but I knew you were a sincere teacher and that you exalted the Bible. So I I've, I've loved uh, your Bible studies, and I agree with 90% 90, 90 of your Bible studies. And I was so glad when you when you saw the error uh, that you've been kind of fooled by uh, church tradition uh, teaching uh, eternal torment, and you came off of that. And I, I really rejoiced when you did. And I told all my friends about it. You know, they're they're kind of naysayers. So I said, "Hey, camping's uh, not teaching uh, eternal torment anymore." Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? Uh that church people really want to hang on to this idea of eternal torment. They have, they have children. Here's a little three-year-old, a little five-year-old, a little one-year-old, and uh, 
if that individual is not one of God's elect and and uh, that's characteristic of, of of every family there are non elect people in that family and that child is going to be punished and suffering horribly torment horrible torment forever and ever for whatever sins it has committed where is the mercy of God you know that's the cruelest idea you can ever imagine and you know God says he blessed are the merciful because they will obtain mercy and and when we have that kind of cruelty in our thinking how can we how can we expect to be under the mercy of God I agree and um I was just, I, I've also wanted to make this comment, and, and you're, you're right on so many things, and I came out of the church, and I, you know, I just rejoice in so many things you teach, but I notice that there are a number of old Catholic doctrines that you still cling to, and I, I would just like to urge you that some of these uh, doctrines that that you, you defend so ardently, uh, maybe uh, your defense on them biblically is a little bit thin, and maybe you ought to reconsider some of these other doctrines that you teach. What, do, uh, what do, Give me an example, please. Well, <clears throat> you know, the holidays, the Sunday Sabbath, and I'm not talking about the Saturday Sabbath. I'm just saying that, that you rationalize the Sunday Sabbath that uh, that we got to have one day where we devote to God, but the fact is that most people that have families can't devote that day to God anyway because their families don't want to, and they're kind of stuck. But uh, you you use that rationalization instead of solid biblical teaching when when it dawned towards the first of the sabbath it was talking about christ it wasn't talking about sunday and so uh well, it, maybe me. you should maybe yeah. no, i'm just that, no excuse me that is not what the bible teaches in matthew 28 it says as it began toward the first of the sabbath and there the god is very clearly saying that Sunday was the beginning of a new era of Sabbath. And now I admit that our King, King James Bible, and as a matter of fact, almost any other Bible, have really messed it up when it came to the word Sabbath. But I have done a very thorough study of this word Sabbath, and, and indeed Sunday is a Sabbath that God gives us. And But anyway, I thank you for calling and sharing and uh, and uh, uh, I hope you, you'll just keep listening maybe so slowly on uh, there'll be a little more learning I'm I'm I keep studying always hoping there'll be a little more learning and boy I can stand that too but shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum good evening brother camping I have a question about the death of the unbelievers um, if the second death is equivalent to the death of the soul, and the no. second death occurs at the end of the day of judgment, how is it that you can say that the carnal death of the unbeliever is coterminous with the demise of their soul? The that is not the, you've set up a, a straw man. Uh, that is that is not true. The second death is not identified with the death of the soul when a person dies he is dead body and soul if you go to Judges 10 for example or or maybe it's Joshua 10 where, uh, where a number of cities were destroyed and it talks about every soul in that, per, in that city was killed that so uh, the, the, the the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The second death is simply indicating that that everything, anything left, dust or corpse or bones or anything of this earth or anything of this universe will all be destroyed forever and ever. It will never, never be in existence again. I see. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome. 
Welcome, Melvin Foy. Okay, shall we take our next call? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping? Yes. Hi, good evening. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I have a question to ask you about uh, two questions, actually. My first question is, uh, why did God allow Solomon to have a thousand wives? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, and sometimes God uses sin also to illustrate what he wants to illustrate. Yeah, you know, those 700 wives and 300 concubines represented, or Solomon was a picture of Christ. Oh, I'll get right back to you on this right after this message. Solomon is one of the most uh, uh, wonderful men the Bible records in a sense that he has, was a man of enormous wisdom. Uh, he gave us the God used him to give us the prophet, the proverbs, and and other things in the Bible, and and God had all kinds of good things to say about Solomon concerning his wisdom, but he had one shortcoming that was a major one: he multiplied wives. Why did God allow him to do it? Well, it 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 almost it, it led, of course to the fact that that uh, in his old age he began to worship other gods that is probably uh, catering to heathen wives and uh, then God took the kingdom away from his son uh, and except for his promise to David uh, he would have taken the whole Israel away from the line of Solomon as it was only two tribes remain that's all part of the plan that God had uh, by allowing Solomon have a thousand wives. But it's also very significant that Solomon is used in the Bible as a portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ as he came to build the temple of God. That is, all those who would become saved within the kingdom of God, beginning with uh, Christ coming to demonstrate how he suffered for our sins. And because you see when we become saved we become the bride of Christ we're a wife of Christ uh, and and a thousand uh, from all different nations and in Solomon's case this was probably more political than anything but nevertheless uh, that he was married to a thousand people a thousand wives they represented the complete number of all those who become saved, who become the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. And and so God used his sin to demonstrate a very, very interesting uh, piece of uh, gospel information that Christ is the bridegroom of a, of a great host of wives because every true believer is eternally the wife of Christ. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome yes, to Open Forum. Yes, hi. Good evening, Brother Campion. Campion. Uh, hey, would you turn your radio off, please? That'll help us to begin with. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, is that better? Yes, go ahead with your call. Okay. Good evening, Brother Canton. Um, I I was um, thinking about the in, Ver in Revelation how um, in the Word of God it talked about the harlot. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Where it spoke where the beast was after a harlot because she was with child, and um, but God allowed water just to. Um, uh, kind of swallow up um, could you could you elaborate a little bit on that well you're talking I know, about, I know it's in Revelation well you're talking let's look at Revelation 17 Revelation and Revelation 18 but particularly Revelation 17 we read there about a, a woman that, that is a harlot she had 
sat upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns in other words it, uh, and, uh, let me say quickly this, this woman represents all those in the churches who believe they are saved but are worshiping Satan this is true all through the 8400 day period the 23 year period of the great tribulation those who remain in the churches are worshiping Satan because God has placed him there to be the head of the churches and the Holy Spirit has absented himself and there's no more possibility of salvation and she is called and on her forehead a name written mystery Babylon in the great the mother of harlots uh, and abominations in the earth in other words she is totally identified with Satan now because she is ruled over by Satan she worships Satan because she thinks she is worshiping Christ but Christ, Satan comes as an angel of light as we read in Second Corinthians 11 and his ministers as ministers of righteousness and, uh, but the whole business is satanic and she is convinced she has the truth she says she says for example I am, I am not going to be a widow I am uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm a success story and that is exactly where the churches are today they don't realize that they have no relationship with Christ and that they are headed for doomsday, for the day of judgment. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Yes, I, I like to know, uh, in the Bible it says, uh, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and forgive your sins, thou shalt be saved. And another scripture says that you must be saved and be baptized. Uh, and you're saying that uh, that's the church's own salvation program. Uh, can you clarify that for me, please? Well, yes. You see, uh, there are many verses. Uh, God very carefully wrote this. this. This is one of the chief terrible sins of the churches in that they have studied the Bible and they have come to the conclusion that if we believe on the Lord Jesus, that, is, that means that we have become saved. And they never read carefully enough to understand that believing is a work that we do. And we cannot, do, we cannot become saved by our work. If we, if we are trusting in any work that we have done, then it's absolutely guaranteed we're not saved. And yet God has written verse after verse that encourages the idea of believing as a, as a basis for our salvation. Like, for example, when Peter is speaking, uh, or, uh, James, or who was it, Paul? Paul was speaking to the, uh, the uh, jailer of Philippi. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the answer is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's as plain as day, isn't it? And yet we have to learn that there's a way to read the Bible. We don't just take the Bible at face value at what we're reading. We have to compare Scripture with Scripture. And we think we have a correct conclusion from a verse, but we cannot know. Yeah, that verse may just be yelling at us. Look, don't you hear what I'm saying? Believe on the Lord Jesus. Could anything be, and thou shalt be saved. Could anything be more plain than that? And yet the Bible warns. Now, wait a minute. Don't make that conclusion too quickly. It may be right or it may not be right. You better first examine that in the light of everything else the Bible teaches. And then we find that it can't be our believing because that's a work that we do. And Galatians chapter 2 teaches 
very clearly that we're saved by the faith of Christ and not by our works of the law. And that's the way many verses are found in the Bible. The believing it is a fact that that's still a true statement. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou wilt be saved because there are those who are saved, that is, they've already received their resurrected soul, but they have not had their salvation completed yet. And as a good work in their, li in their life, they are, uh, have come to really trust God Christ implicitly as their Savior, and, and, uh, but the salvation is not what... The, that doesn't give them salvation. They've all, they're already saved, but they still are going to be saved some more in that they're going to re receive their resurrected body at the last day. But the, this, you know, where this word believe is peppered all through the New Testament. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, on the other hand, when <laughs> already in the Old Testament... And this is really, really something. But it's, uh, and I'm, I wonder how many pastors have ever read this. But we read in Ezekiel 36, where God describes how he saves us. Verse 24, For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. This is Ezekiel 36, verse 24. Then... Well, I, this is God speaking, I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Will I cleanse you? A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. <laughs> you see, there God is really describing how salvation comes about. It's all the work of God. And that's why... Uh, we we uh, are, wait upon the Lord. We wait upon the Lord. We pray and beg God and plead with God, and uh, but we have to wait upon Him. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping? Yes. <clears throat> uh, yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I was listening to one of your programs over the weekend, and uh, <clears throat> I got a little confused when uh, I heard you mention something about the Sabbath day being part of the Old Testament, or did, did, did I get that wrong? I mean, is it true in the New Testament as well as in the Old Testament? The seventh day, I, I, I don't... In other words, you're I, not supposed to work... Uh, do any kind of work on the seventh day. In other well, words, it's not out with the old and in with the new. Well, because the seventh day Sabbath was distinctly a ceremonial day, a ceremonial day, and uh, all the ceremonial activities were a shadow of things to come, like we read in Colossians chapter 2 in the New Testament, where... God tells us in Colossians 2 that that uh, uh, let no verse 16 let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink they were ceremonial activities of the Old Testament or respect of a holy day like the Passover day or of the new moon, or of the Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance, but the body is of Christ. In other words, they were anticipating uh, various things about God's, the unfolding of God's salvation plan, but they were, uh, they were not to be obeyed as moral law. None of, we don't, offer burnt offerings anymore, or blood sacrifices, or, uh, or observe any of the Old Testament ceremonial days, so we shouldn't be observing the seventh-day Sabbath. Now, what was it anticipating? 
we read in Exodus chapter 31 that I have given you my seventh day Sabbath to indicate that I, the Lord, sanctify thee. In other words, you are not to do any work of any kind to get yourself saved, just as in the ceremonial law, you are not to do any work on the seventh day Sabbath. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Campy. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Look, I would like for you to look up Second uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 16. And as you look that up, um, I know you was talking about the Word of God being hard to understand, but in Psalm 119, 130, the Bible says, The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. And I've been listening to you. Uh, Mr. Campbell, you've kind of cut a lot of people off. There's been, said they had a couple questions for you. And you didn't let them respond. And even the man at, at, at the initial, in the beginning, that was kind of hard to understand, you didn't give him time to express himself to you. But the lady that was slow, when she said something about offering, you 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 sort of took time out. No, and you excuse heard her. me. Excuse me. That wasn't just because she was talking about offering. I could understand her, even though she was talking slowly. And if I can understand her, then our listeners can understand her. But when we in, here in our studio, if we can't understand a caller, then we know the listeners can't understand. And and then we, it's not fair to our listeners, and it doesn't do any 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 justice to the program because we're using up time when nobody understands what's going on, and so we go to the next caller. Now, what is your question in no, Second, Second Peter, Peter three sixteen? As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. Uh, let, let's let's let me back up. Uh, let me start with verse fourteen to pick up the context. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, and it's been talking about the final end of the world, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. In other words, it really is emphasizing, and this is particularly true today, make sure that you are humble, walking humbly before God and that you're looking only to God for your salvation and not in anything that you have done. An account that, we're, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also according to to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you. As also in all epistles speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, that is, they twist, as they do the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. And you see, we have to be very careful when we're dealing with the Bible, that we we don't try to make the Bible say what we want it to say, but that we come to the Bible, Oh, Lord, I don't know anything. You teach me. And there's a whole difference in the way in those two ways of coming to the Bible. Cappy. Yes. All right. Well, here's the whole point. That scripture, to me, it fits you. As I listen to you, just like the man in the beginning, he wants you to read Isaiah 6. You read a few, uh, it had three more verses to go, and you wouldn't complete it. You you wrestle with scriptures, and you twist them. And excuse you have... me. Now, excuse me. I don't, I don't know how you are listening. I was ready to read just a few verses in Isaiah 6. He wanted me to talk about the whole chapter. And because it's a very, very... Uh, an important chapter. I did spend quite a lot of time going through the chapter, and uh, just exactly the opposite of what you are charging here. So I don't know what what your point is, but it certainly is not uh, upbuilding. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, 
I had a question about uh, I, I forget it's somewhere in the New Testament that uh, I think it's Jesus saying that uh, if you find yourself uh, going to church and you realize you have something against somebody, go straighten it out first, then go to church. I think that's in the yeah, Bible somewhere yeah, in yeah, the New yeah. Testament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, now that we no longer have to go or. Uh, you know, we were at the end of the church age. It, 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 we supposed to mean the well, but the uh, spiritual church. Well, no, it's, we are a member of the eternal church. Yes, we are a member of the eternal church, and the prince, the spiritual principles still hold that if we believe that we're a child of God, that is that we are a member of the eternal church, which God is still building today. And we have something against uh, someone else that is unresolved. We are we hold uh, contempt of someone, or we because remember the Bible says love your enemies. Uh, or if we are uh, um, resentful against somebody and unforgiving for what they have done to us, then we have a serious question that we have to face. Am I really a member of the eternal church, or am I just kidding myself? Am I just giving myself the the nice look without really examining myself honestly and carefully? And you know, uh, sometimes uh, after we have been thinking we've been a child of God for a long time, and then as we examine once more, we find out, but really, not really have we been a child of God. It's a shocker. It's a real shocker. And and yet, there's nothing more healthy than to come broken before God and, oh God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. I hope that I too might be, be a child of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. How you doing, Mr. Kathy? Very well, thank you. Good. I um, have a couple questions for you. First question, I heard uh, somebody call you on the Open Forum and asked you what type of spiritual experience you had. You told them that your children had a Ouija board and the word Satan came up on it and you got rid of it. Uh, how long was it? that the children had this Ouija board in your home. Well, now, excuse me. That that was a, a, a one-night existence. I, I had been doing the open forum in San Francisco at that time. That was long, long ago. And I had two children. Uh, one, in, in, mm, one was still in high school. And she had brought home that afternoon a Ouija board. I knew nothing about it because I was, uh, until uh, 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 I came home late at night and they were playing with that Ouija board. And of course it was out the next morning. Uh, never again would I ever have a Ouija board in my home. Okay, thank, thank you very much. My second question is, uh, when did you leave the church? Well, I, I, it, it went this way. It was curious. It was the year 1988, and and I had a, I was teaching a class, uh, uh, one of the adult classes. We had two adult classes, and there were about 60 people in the class that I taught. Almost everyone coming from places outside of the normal. Uh, uh, People that belonged to our church because our church was uh, it was a uh, had its origins as a Dutch church, Christian Reformed church. But I, I, uh, uh, they were coming because I was teaching on the open forum, and they, uh, and so we did start this class. Well, then we got a new pastor, and uh, the new pastor uh, didn't like my teaching very much. Or I don't know. He, he, he I, I think that was one of the problems. Or may, uh, also, I think he was a little envious because these people would gather around me after 
church, and some of them indeed had become deacons in our church and so on. But they, but he was a little uh, envious of that. Why shouldn't they go to him? He was the pastor. But these people knew me and trusted me. So anyway, he finally, after a few years, got a consistory together that would follow his desires, and uh, they had a, a long meeting uh, retreat, and they came back and called me and said, you know, we, uh, this was probably in March or so of 1988, and they called me and they said, you know, uh, we uh, would like to further develop our congregation, and uh, we think that every, no, no class ought to be have over 20 people within it. And secondly, we do believe that the teacher of the class ought to be an elder. Well, at the time, I was neither elder, and I had a class of about 60 people. And I immediately saw the handwriting on the wall. They did not want me any longer as a teacher. So I said to them, well, uh, I'll... uh, are uh, 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 you have a right to do what you wish, but uh, why don't you uh, really think about this? And I met with their consistory uh, to talk with them about it, and uh, uh, they didn't change their mind. I didn't say anything to any of our Sunday school class because I told them uh, when I met with them that if if I cannot teach here, I'll have to leave because... I want to be a teacher somewhere. I feel that God has called me to be a teacher. Well, that's, of course, exactly what they wanted. They wanted me out. So it was in uh, around the first week of June. I still remember it vividly that the pastor made the announcement that beginning in the fall when the new classes began, we would only we would have no class of more than 20 people and the adult classes would all be uh, taught by the elders and of course our Sunday school class was very upset about all of this and I said now look look let's do everything decently in good order you talk to your elder if you're a member already and see if you can change their mind and and there were some more meetings that were held with uh, people uh, 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 people from other churches to make sure that everything was being done decently, and so then we finally left. In uh, uh, in uh, we uh, uh, you know, about or August or so we left, and we left on good terms. We didn't fight. We left our membership there for a while because we were hoping to start another a congregation of some kind. But it was very curious that this was all happening right close to May 21 of 2000, uh, of 1988, which I knew at the time already was the end of the church age. But now we've come to the end of this program. And until our next program, may the Lord richly bless you.